I'm the editorial director of Book Trib. And on today's Facebook Live author interview, we're going to be talking about this book, U.S. Education is in Trouble, Let's Fix It, 22 Reform Proposals by Richard Garrett, who's with me here. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi, Jim. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm going to start off by reading a quote. This quote is not from Richard, but it's in his book, and I'm sure he will recognize it. Um, here it is. We need to regain that relentless focus on getting an education in the face of obstacles. That's what we need to reclaim as a community and as a nation. We need to start feeling that, that hunger again to fight to educate ourselves and our children like our lives depend upon it, because they do. Now, that quote, again, Richard uses it in, in his book, it was spoken about a decade ago by Michelle Obama. She was giving a commencement speech, and here we are 10 years later, and according to, to Richard, you know, who has been a crusader, you know, and in, 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 in engaged in research and educational reform for since 2013, the battle is raging on and still has a ways to go. Uh, in his book, he methodically and intricately shares with readers why the existing situation is so dire and aims to offer some solutions to fix it, as, as the title indicates. So, so Dick, just, just to get rolling, how, how did this project come about? Tell, tell me the, the, the basis of sort of where you got started. Well, about 10 years ago, uh, I decided that uh, our kids were not getting a fair shake on education, that some are, maybe as Bill Gates says, the top 20% are doing just fine, but the other 80% are, are suffering. And this, uh, to a large extent, came about by a series of phone calls that my teacher's son made to me on his way home from work almost every day. And he would tell me about things that I thought were just terrible. And what, so, what grade, just what grade was he teaching? Fourth grade. Okay. Fourth grade. One of four teachers in an inner city fourth grade school. Uh, and, uh, but he was talking about his school, not always just his fourth grade or his own grade. So I decided that uh, maybe I could help. So rather than in any more discussion about this, to say I got, got involved and I've been involved with both feet, my whole body and everybody, <laughs> everything on this Great. problem. Because the more, as I say in the book, the more you know, the worse it gets. Well, and this is what motivates you. You know, Speaking you, about the more you know and what you do know, um, how would you characterize the current state of U.S. public education? Well, I have a lot I could pick from for that. I right, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, the public. How does the public feel about it? A, a Gallup survey just came out that says... Uh, 58% of our public is not satisfied with the public school education system. That is the worst it's been in 24 years. So um, the public is, is well aware that we've got a problem. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the measures in chapter two that I bring out. And one of the worst, and I think most disappointing is that if you look at the national assessment exam given out of the U.S. Department of, of Education, 48 years have gone by and we have not had any improvement in reading and math for two age groups. And the implication of this is that all of the federal monies that have been spent to bolster education have not worked because there's no, no improvement. So... Also in, in uh, chapter two, I talk about the fact that 47% of our kids are getting an A average when they graduate. And this is a good example of what I'll talk about in a minute of every kid gets a trophy because uh, I'll tell you that they're not all eight students when in fact, during those same time periods, our US SAT scores dropped. The other thing that's confusing to parents in particular, if their kids are bringing home A's and you ask them, uh, is your child behaving or performing at or above grade level? They said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and they don't say it, but in their mind, they know they're bringing home A's. But when you look into it, only 30% are. So we are deluding ourselves with giving our kids trophies that they haven't earned. My last oh, point is one of the ahead. most important is the teacher shortage it is going to get it's huge it's going to get worse and it is a major issue it looks like uh, we're headed towards only a hundred thousand teachers a year coming out of the system and we need three hundred thousand 
So that is a major problem. Okay, then that's enough. Bad stuff. Well, you know, so, some of the numbers you said, they're, they're kind of stunning. And, 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 you know, I mean, part of what I wanted to ask you is, is, could we have seen this coming? But you're telling me 48 years, there's been no improvement by certain measures. Let, let me ask you, does that mean that, that, that the measures that they were trying to to implement just weren't good ones. Does it? It almost seems for, for that length of time that just there's no focus, or, or or people just don't care. What I mean, how do you how do you answer that? Find another measure and you'll get the same result. Mm -hmm. uh, the Department of Education puts out other uh, metrics on test performance, and they don't show any improvement either. So we're you know I don't care how you cut it, we're not getting any better. Um, so anyway, could we have seen this coming? I, I'll share my own experience. Um, I think it was the second George Bush that initiated a program to make teachers more accountable. And one of the ways they would do that is they test the kids every year. And if the teachers weren't showing improved scores then they'd be somehow notified or whatever, I don't know, maybe pay cut, maybe even fired. Um, so that that has been going on. And when those tests started, as I looked at the stats in the paper, only about 30 to 35 percent of the students in Indiana were passing both the math and the reading passing. I'm not talking about any level of proficiency, just just passing. So what do I think? Well, well, next year it'll get better. Somebody in the education department will grab a hold of this problem in the education system and they'll fix it. Well, it's gone on and on and on and on, and it's never been fixed. So we're still right where we were. And it's just another indication of another measurement system that doesn't show any improvement. And that's the state, state by state measures. So you know, you, you, you had you had mentioned, uh, you know, some sort of uh, monitoring the progress or, or, or the proficiency of teachers. But that's also a two way street because, you know, my, my question is, do we have happy teachers? Do we have a pipeline of people that want to get in this profession or are some of, you know, some of the realities of, of the job and what's going on? Uh, maybe they're thinking, hey, I want to I just want to get out of this profession. How, how do we how do we keep that pipeline, you know, uh, such that it attracts good, good teachers? That's a good question. In in the. Uh... For years, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company connected, uh, performed a national survey of teacher satisfaction. And in 2006, it was 62%. And a couple of years, few years later, they quit doing it because we were on a huge downward trend. Uh, another university picked up, or a university, not another, picked up that measure. And now we only have 12% of the teachers that are happy. And yes, indeed, you know, we have a bunch of unhappy teachers and they are leaving. And unfortunately, many of them are telling, and I ran into a school principal of a major Indianapolis high school, said she'd never advise anybody to go into education. It's just a mess. So uh, we're in trouble. Do we have a pipeline coming? I estimate that our schools of education are running at about 40% capacity. So nobody wants to go into education hardly. They know what goes on in the classroom. They see the films. They see the, the news uh, broadcast of fighting and conflict and so forth. They don't want any part of that. So we got a major problem there. Let's talk about let's talk about another another group, and that's the parents. You know, what is the role of parents and and common mistakes that you see that are hindering the education process from their perspective? Well, let me start off by saying, uh, when, and, and I, I make parents of the 22 uh, reform uh, metrics that I, or proposals that I make, uh, parroting is the first one, but I, I must say right off the bat, there are two kinds of parroting issues. One is there are a set of parents out there that are absolutely phenomenal at making a school superior. If they get behind the teachers and get behind the system and so forth, they can produce excellent schools. On the other hand, there are a bunch of teachers, and I don't know percentages. Parents, teachers or parents? Uh, parents, rather, who can be destructive. They can be obnoxious. They sue. They chew out the teachers. I've had teachers tell me that the kids are okay, but it's the parents that give them the most trouble. So um, the second these bad guys are really ruining the system, 
because they don't stress a respect for teachers and respect for schools, the teachers are being insulted frequently by the kids claiming it's their second amendment right, first amendment right to uh, say anything they want to to the teacher. And well, they know, get away with it, but then the people leave education. You know, Dick, there's the issue of of the parent that stays in the teacher's face, you know, and just makes life difficult. Or that they always have something to say, or they, they, you know, they're out there and and they're easily recognizable. But what about the parents in nurturing their kids at home? Are they doing? what's necessary and what's expected to support the educational system? Or are they just so focused on, on speaking out and, and, and getting out there that, that they've lost sight of that? Well, um, clearly, I mean, why does a kid call a teacher a bitch? And it happens all the time. It happened to my niece's uh, daughter all the time. Why do they do that? Well, like, number one, they can get away with it. But number two, their parents have no control over their behavior because they never taught them how to respect anybody. And, and so they show this disrespect to the teachers and administrators in the school. So it's, it's on the parents back to teach the kids to respect and honor these teachers who are putting out their lives. They're putting their time against uh, to make these kids better people. So uh, they're major influence or bad influence for these guys, these parents. Okay. So we, I'm sure we could go on and on and, and, and talk about how we got to where we are and what all the problems are, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, I think. And, and when we were talking about your book, you always emphasize to me, Jim, make sure you are including, uh, you know, 22 reform proposals. It's yes. we have, we have ideas to, to, you know, to, to try to fix this. So let's talk about that a little bit. I, I mean, can you give me some highlights of, of that or just maybe an overview of the kinds of things that, that you're proposing that people have to focus on? Okay, I have 22 proposals and the first four I order put in sequence of what I think are the most important, in this case, root causes of the problems. And as we just discussed, I make parenting number one. Number two is school boards and school superintendents are not doing their job. Who's responsible for the sorry state of affairs that we're in today? Well, let's ask ourselves, who's responsible for education? It's the 16,148 school boards and school systems around the nation that are not doing their job. And I'm going to catch a lot of flack on this, but I... I'm not going to back off either. It's it's the way I feel it is. The third one is runaway discipline. And that gets back to parenting. You know, the parents have not taught the kids respect. They don't teach them respect for education. They don't talk about their future. You know, how they can be a different person if they get educated. They just don't do that. Some of them, though, but a lot of good ones. And, and the last one is, and I think this is the one that's the most unexcusable uh, that can be fixed, and that's social promotion. When a child in the third grade is promoted to the fourth grade and they cannot read. So, and they never catch up. I have another metric, another measurement that shows that 25% of our adult population, high school graduates, can only read at a 10th, 10 year old level. So this shows that when you push a kid forward in school, many of them never catch up. So those are the four top ones, and the rest of them are important, but less important than these. You know, you you make it clear when you when you write about the the proposals. You say, look, this is not a final statement. It's more a starting point, and just you know, ways to get going. I mean, obviously, you're not saying. Here's here's the, uh, the you know it's not like Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments, but clearly you're saying this is sort of a framework of, of what we have to be talking about. How how do you how do we get going? How, how do you get started? Where do you even begin? Well, that's a that's an excellent point. Obviously, you can't do all of my twenty two at once. You can do a lot of them. Uh, for example, uh, setting standards with forty seven percent A's somebody's let the grading standard fall way, way offline. 
So in my recommendations, I recommend that state school boards and state school superintendents be assigned the responsibility for standards throughout their state. And uh, so that would be a start to raise the standards. And I must say that if you read about my uh, history of the Massachusetts reform in the early 90s, it was a large degree based on elevated standards. So that alone would do a lot of good. But in terms of who's going to fix the problem, it is not going to come from education. It is not going to come from superintendents or Washington, D.C. departments of education. They've had plenty of opportunities to fix this problem, and they just let it go by. My strategy is to look to chambers of commerce, because I think they have the biggest vested interest. Two ways. Number one, they need future employees. They need people that are trained differently than, than the old time students. And number two, they need to foster communities that have good school systems so that their people will want to live in that community. So I'm really focusing on chambers. Whether I'll get that done or not, we'll just have to wait and see. So, okay. And, and, and let me ask you, just, just so that, you know, we, we don't, I mean, clearly we paint a little doom and gloom here. You have seen some initiatives that are heading in the right direction, yes? Not very many, but there are a few. <laughs> uh, it's like I tried to feed you with it. You have, right? Yeah. You're saying, well, not necessarily. Okay. It, it, it just seems that as bad off as we are, there ought to be popping up all over the place, you know, improvement methods. and They may be. I can't keep track of every state, but um, Maryland started – a massive reform movement. Maryland used to be one of the top systems. And when they started looking at, and this commission was formed, uh, they started looking at their kids' performance. They said that uh, they were not where we thought they were, nor are they where they ought to be. So they set a goal, and they found out at that early stage that only 40% of their high school graduates were what are called college and career ready. Their performance is... Only 40% of them are suitable to go to college or to a trade school. The uh, goal they set for somewhere down the pike is 80%. So they want to move that from 40 to 80%. Wisconsin, where I am right now, is like 34. Indiana, where I live in the wintertime, is, uh, is about the same. So uh, that's not a very good performance record. Tennessee has passed a law that required kids to be able to read going into the third grade. And I may have this a little bit wrong, but we'll we'll see. But basically, they did not enforce it, particularly because of COVID. Now they resurrected that and they're going to demand or insist that their kids be able to read. And that is a brilliant move on their part to make a big impact in a hurry. So I can only, I only think of those few. Okay. So, so just, you know, you kind of in, in, in summation, it sounds like the book is geared for a lot of disciplines. I mean, uh, you know, you can talk about government organizations, teachers, parents, um, maybe students at a level where they can understand what's going on. What do, you, what do you hope to accomplish by writing the book? Very simple. I want more kids to have a respectable quality education. That's what this is all about. I want kids to get a break. And if you read my book, you'll learn at the very beginning that my father was a hobo. He was a bum. He met a guy in Saskatchewan, uh, a wheat farmer that he worked for, that motivated him to get an education. He died a judge. So I want other kids to have the advantage of making it in life on the education track. So that's the sum total of my objectives. Well, I, I think that's a very good objective. We could go on and on with you yes, know, taking a look at the at the system at, at talking about some of the solutions. But I, I think the the really the answer is is get a hold of this book and read yeah, it. U.S. Education is in trouble. Let's fix it. 22 reform proposals. If you want to learn more about Richard and his work, his website is elevateteachers.org elevateteachers.org. Richard, thanks so much for the time. Thank uh, Thank it's you, an exciting Jim. topic. It's an important topic. And uh, you've shed some great light on it. So thanks, thanks very for much. the interview. You take care. Okay, thanks. Bye.